school burned. It okay. always seemed so far, but the school was up there. Okay. And at lunch hour, where I would walk down, down here, yeah. and I could usually expect to see my grandfather sitting along with his cronies there on the curb, smoking a cigarette. And I go and visit with him, and he'd always say, "You remember my granddaughter? She's going to go off to college, and she's going to going to uh, learn to speak English. She's going to speak in, She knows speaks English." but she's going to learn to teach English, and she's going to go and teach the little white children how to speak their own language. He said, but she still knows how to speak Cheyenne. She can still speak our language. And yeah, that was her, he said. Represented stability in my life and love. This is still home to me. I grew up here. It's where my roots are. It's a good place. It was a strong Indian community. I'm a Hammond girl. I was born here. I grew up here. I belong here. I'm a part of this land. This sky, this air. It has been very important that I balance those two ways of life. And were it possible to just live as a Cheyenne woman, then I, it, it would have been all the better for me. But I live in a different time and a place than my great grandmother, than, than my grandparents, than, than those that were on this earth at the beginning of time. And, and what our ancestors stress is the fact that we live in balance and in harmony with the time and the place in which we live. So it is very important that I learned to speak English, the, that I was educated in the educated for the times in which I live. And I don't feel a schism. I, I'm perfectly whole. And life has been exceptionally challenging for me. It was a challenge to work in a university setting. It was a challenge in the respect that there were not many people of color who were teaching in higher education when I started teaching, and that was in the early 1970s. I had to confront two basic challenges. One, being a Cheyenne Indian woman, an American Indian woman, and on the other hand, being female. It was almost as if I had to operate at 200% level all the time. Rolling Stone magazine selected me in 1991 to be one of the 10 top professors on, in the country in terms of its honor roll. That was as my equivalent uh, of a Minor Nobel laureate. Because I, I probably, I mean, would, would receive, in my estimation, no higher honor than to have been so recommended by students and to have been placed on the honor roll by none other than Rolling Stone magazine. Uh, my granddaughter had, was born in the East in Maryland and has lived away from my experiences as a child growing up. And with her, with the move of her family back into our homelands, uh, she uh, is. Uh, beginning to understand and walk that cultural aspect of her life. I think it's going to be very helpful to her in terms of finding that, that balance between who she is in terms of her identity as both Cheyenne and Arapaho, I'm just Cheyenne, and, and, and living in this world that has its own challenges, it has its own orientation. 
um, she'll be good at it. She'll be very successful. Uh, she, when she was younger, she couldn't speak English very well. She spoke with a lisp. And yet, whenever she and I were, and I was teaching her Cheyenne, that was a language of, that was her language, because she did not have any of those kind of spe speech impediments in Cheyenne that she demonstrated in the English language. She didn't, she did not speak Cheyenne with a lisp. And uh, uh, whereas I have not been around them, as grandmothers traditionally used to be, I take the time to, to not just teach them language, but to teach them how to be good Cheyennes, to be respectful of, of people in, in life, to, to make sure that, that, uh, that they are generous of heart and spirit. And you have to remember that uh, the indigenous peoples of this land have been locked into cycles of poverty for us as Plains Indians since the mainstay of our economy, the bison, was destroyed. It was for every bison dead or buffalo, for every buffalo dead, an Indian dead. And it was expensive to to try to I guess overpower us militarily. If figures say that it cost the United States federal government about a million dollars to kill every Indian, and that was when they decided that it would be cheaper to educate us. And so with that was where this whole cycle of poverty uh, was inaugurated and, in, and initiated. Since us, maybe 20, 30 years ago, maybe, uh, we finally begin to identify a, a developing middle class among American Indians. So maybe we finally broken that cycle of poverty. Maybe it's those casinos that some people consider to be the new buffalo of this century that are helping to break those pockets of poverty in which we have been kept tightly locked for a period, for, for centuries. Our children face that. And, and of course, we know that, that poverty and a way out of that poverty really uh, can be overcome through education, which is then the reason why the Cheyennes and Arapahoes committed themselves to establishing their own college to provide access to higher education to, to make sure then that we begin to empower our young people again, that we take control of their education, that we provide them with the means of educating themselves to learning new skills, new knowledge areas that are once more going to make them independent, empowered individuals who can care for themselves and their families. I think that's what education is, is really all about. To learn those strong values, again, I believe is a function of our colleges. And to... Uh, to recognize the fact that we come out of cultures that have traditionally had very strong value systems that would help to begin to offset uh, the kind of social and economic ills that many Indian nations and their youth face today.